eco-friendly uh, church in the Bible was when um, Moses went up to get the law and and um, got the law, and then you know, of course, you know, Aaron was a weak leader, and the people said, "Make us a god," and and so you know, he did, and they uh, worshipped their worship. They were into orgies and all kinds of music was playing and dancing, and they were having joyous occasions. That's not necessarily the whole uh, of the matter. What's going to keep a person is being solidified in doctrine and true scriptural ex expository preaching, uh, not some of these little uh, stories. I heard a preacher today say he doesn't preach anymore in the Bible. He doesn't preach. He just tells a story. Uh, and that seems to be the, the going rum. They don't want to offend anybody. They want to make it uh, you know, a place where people can come and feel comfortable. Well, um, I'm sorry to say that's not our church. And uh, as long as I'm pastor, never will be. So, um, well, it looks like we're going to be finishing up Acts either today or next week. I don't know how far we'll get. We're going to start 28, but there's a lot of um, just closing out of things that's going to be happening. I believe April, uh, August 9th is when I'll give out the certificates if you've been here 80% of the time, which most of you have been. And if you want a certificate in the Wednesday Bible study, you have to go back on our website and watch most of what you've missed, and then we'll offer you the certificate also. Uh, verse uh, 1, starting in chapter 28 tonight in the book of Acts, as we come to a conclusion, uh, either this week or next week, as I was saying, uh, it, uh, the book of Acts has been a blessing, amen? And I hope you've grown from it and you've learned some things from it and applied some things from it, and you'll be able to share with others from the book of Acts also. Praise the Lord. Starting with verse 1, it says, And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. <clears throat> and I want to stop there for a moment. It doesn't mean that they, didn't sh they showed no kindness. It, was, it, was, it means just the opposite. It means they showed a whole lot of kindness. And uh, it says, uh, For they kindled a fire, received us, everyone because of the present rain and because of the cold. So you can see the conditions there were pretty pretty harsh uh, when they were traveling. It wasn't like summer weather, 80 degrees. They were on, on a ship somewhere, you know, sailing anywhere. It was cold. It was rainy. It was messy. Uh, it was an uncomfortable thing. And it says here, And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. Now, some people I've heard say the snake came out of the fire. That's impossible. because The, fire, the snake would have been dead. The viper would have been dead. But you know how snakes like warmth. So they were, he was curled up somewhere near the fire. But when Paul went there, it kind of disturbed him a little bit. And as he threw those sticks on, and maybe one of them hit him off the head or something. I don't know. I wasn't there. But I can just imagine. And uh, that snake got a little ornery and came up, and it says here that it, it uh, fastened on his hand. Now, I don't know if you've ever been bitten by anything that's poisonous, but it, it can cause a real strong reaction in your body. Uh, I got bit by a rec recluse spider when I was in Kentucky years ago, and immediately after the bite, I, I started to go into it like shaking like this, and my body was shaking, and I felt numb, and I felt like I was going to pass out, and my brother that I was with, he prayed for me, and we prayed, and we bound the devil in Jesus' name, and uh, it went away a few seconds later, and I was fine. Um, it's nothing to, um, to uh, fool with. In fact, uh, there is a church called the Snake Handlers, the Pentecostal Snake Handlers, and they have snakes in the, on the altar, and they go and they handle these snakes. Apparently, one of the deacons was fooling with it, got bit, and he died. Uh, so uh, you can't tempt the Lord by, you know, doing these things, going, getting a snake and trying to let the snake bite you and see that you can live. That's tempting the Lord. You don't tempt the Lord that way. And uh, so Paul here, he's innocent. He's walking by, and his hand was there. He threw the sticks on the fire. The, the serpent got a little aggravated, came up and bit him onto his hand and latched onto his hand. You say, well, Pastor, how do you know he latched onto his hand? Because it says he shook him off <laughs> in the next verse. And when Paul had, it says, and, and when the barbarians saw uh, the uh, venomous beast hang on his hand, 
they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer. Don't you just love it when people come up with conjecture? You know, they see something, and they only know the thing that they see. But they don't know all the facts. And so they're ready to make a judgment based on, on something like this and say, oh, yeah, he's got to be a murderer or something. You know, if something bad is karma coming back at him. Something, you know, what you sow, you reap. Something's happening to him, so he must be a murderer or something. You know, especially if he's going to Caesar to be judged. He says, whom though he had escaped from the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. They expected him to die. Isn't that what people do? They look at us as Christians and they make judgments against us and they say things about us. You know, people can come into the church and, and then if they don't hear what they like, oh, I'm not going back to that church. You know, they're not a loving church or they're not this kind of church or they're not that kind of church. But they've only been here 5, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. They don't know the full, full thing of it. And, and, you know, as a pastor, we, you know, we go through things like that because, you know, um, there was somebody in our church, I won't mention who it was, that she got offended by something and, uh, and ended up leaving for a short while and came back. Um, nobody here tonight, thank God, so it won't be at you. Um, and um, uh, I called him on the phone and I said, listen, you were offended over this one little thing? I said, how about the 99 things that we've done for you? How about the 99 times we've shown love and we've done all these things and cared for you? Doesn't that count for anything? Or are you just going to magnify the one little thing that just happened and uh, talk to that person? And they, they kind of said, okay, you know, and kind of understood. See, that's what people do. They, they look at things that are done in, in, in the right now, but they don't see all the picture. And see, like these people, they, they don't know who Paul was. They don't know what kind of a man he was. They don't know what kind of man he used to be and who he is now. And all they see is a, a, you know, him trying to help by putting some wood on the fire and trying to get a little bit warmer, a little bit drier maybe. Okay, And now the snake comes up and bites him and it's hanging on his hand. Think about that. I don't know if he was left-handed or right-handed or whatever. It probably was right-handed, threw it on there. He got bit there and here's a snake hanging on his arm. Oh, that guy, he must be a murderer. Already to, already to condemn the guy, you know, already to, but that's human nature. And that just shows you what human nature will do. That's why the Bible says, walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So if you see me coming out of a bar room, don't expect to say that I was out there drinking or doing anything. I'm probably going in and having a nice meal. Can I get a good amen? Hallelujah. Unless you see me staggering all over the place, then you can make the right proper judgment. But you know what? Uh, you know, don't, don't look at that because there's a lot of places that serve alcohol today and that's just the way it is. Restaurants are like that. You know, At one time, Christians wouldn't go anywhere near a place like that. But you know what? That's because they're afraid. They might fall. But I can tell you right here, for after 35 years, I haven't had a drink, never want one, don't care for one. Hallelujah. I don't have to turn to alcohol to solve my problems. I go to Jesus. Amen? Praise the Lord. And so he said, oh, he must be a murderer. You know, he escaped the sea, but he's, no, vengeance is going to not suffer him to live. And verse 5 says, and he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. People say, wow, man, how can that be? A human being gets bit by a venomous snake, and he, there's no harm to him. Well, it wasn't his time. That's not how God chose or allowed, I should say, not chose, but allowed him to die. He was going to die a martyr in Rome, and we all know that from the end result, but at the time they didn't know that. you know. And, and sometimes we think that the, the enemy has our, our life in his hands. No, he doesn't. Our life is in God's hands. You know, that, just like when we pray for people that go on vacation, like we prayed for you, you know, we expect you to come back. We don't expect things to go wrong, you know, and things can, but, you know, but we believe that God would, would, uh, would uh, protect and give traveling mercies, and he always does, and we thank him for it. But here, Paul was, uh, with the snake on his hand, he shook it off, and nothing happened to him. So you think that ended the situation right then and there, right? Well, it didn't. How be it, they looked when he should have swollen <laughs> or fallen down dead, suddenly. You can imagine the voices. How come he's not, de how come he's not fallen dead? How come he's not swollen yet? That's what happens when you get a bite like that. But after they had looked at him, looked at, 
looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds. <laughs> My God, one minute he's a murderer, he's no good, he's, you know, he's really rotten, there's something, something's happening to him to the core, he's not... He's just not right, you know, he's not a good human being. He must have done something wrong to deserve what he did. Now, all of a sudden, they change their mind. That's what happens with people in the world. They flip-flop. You know, they, they say, see one thing, and they go after it. And, then, and when they find out that that's not true or that's not going to happen, they flip-flop to the other side. So they said to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now he's divine. Before he was the devil, now he's divine. Okay? But that's human nature. Human nature will look, at the, will look at the negative, and if the negative doesn't work out, then they'll make something out of you that you're not. And verse 7 says, And the same quarters were possessions of the chief men of the island, whose name was a pubilus, and who received us, lodged us for three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Pubilus said, lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. Now, either God is still in the healing business or he's not. Now, some people say that the gifts are not for today. They've ended in the book of Acts. I don't see that anywhere. In fact, I don't even see the book of Acts ending, and we'll come to that. Every other letter has a benediction except the book of Acts because it, it never ended. It's still going on. Not that the book is being written, but the things uh, that are going on in the book of Acts should still be going on because that's the, that's the whole foundation of the church is the book of Acts. Christ being the chief cornerstone. So, for people to say that these things should stop, they shouldn't stop, they should keep going. But we have to ask ourselves the question, why aren't these things going? Well, I believe it's one reason, one reason only. Jesus said to, to his disciples, the very important thing he said, he said when he said, when the, when the Son of Man comes back to the earth, will he find faith? Well, maybe he didn't know about the faith movement that's out there. You know, maybe he didn't really realize that he was part of what's going to be taking place. Or what he said was, will he find faith on the earth? Biblical, strong, biblical faith. And he was questioning that. In the end times, before he comes back, Will he find faith on the earth like it was in the, in, during the time he lived? And the answer is, maybe not. Maybe some little spurts here and there. Some people, To have faith is to please God. To believe that God can still do the same things he did yesterday, today, and forever is to have faith. That when you lay hands on somebody, they're going to recover. But a lot of times we allow the flesh to take over. And the thoughts, what if it doesn't happen? That's unbelief. That's not having faith. Paul didn't walk into this room where this sick person was that had a fever and a bloody flux, and say, okay, God, I hope this works. No, it says he went in, prayed, laid his hands on him, and healed him. And if we're going to follow the works of Jesus Christ, then we must be like they were. What were they? Were they theologians? Not necessarily. Were they... College graduates? Probably not. Then what made them different? 
They believe. They believe. You go to a foreign country and you see people getting healed and all this stuff, they simply believe the scripture. They believe it. They don't question it. They believe it. And they leave the results with God. They just go, and God, I'm going to go and I'm going to believe you to do this. And they, and they, but the key to that is being a disciple. He gave that authority to his disciples, disciplined ones, those that are willing to pay the price, those that are living in the spirit, walking in the spirit, not fulfilling the lust of the flesh, those that are praying, those that are fasting, those that are seeking him for the gifts that they have in their life, those are the ones that God uses. But the ones that show no uh, very little interest, guess what? He's not going to use you. You know, some I know one one friend of mine, he has a gift of teaching. Okay? And for 30 years has done nothing with it. What are you going to do with that when you stand before Jesus? What's he going to do? But yet he's occupied in so many other things. He can do all kind of great things on other, other issues, but when it comes to the very calling of God, he's not doing anything. What really matters? Doing what God has called you to do. Okay, where were we? So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were what? Healed. So first of all, they say and they look at Paul and call him a God. Now he's doing all these miracles. You can imagine what they thought then. But when he healed this man, what happened? The report of that went out. Others heard that were sick and came. And Paul, as his custom was, laid hands on them. And guess what? And they were healed. And then it says, who also honored us with many honors, and when we departed, they labeled us, they laded us with such things as were necessary. In other words, they were serving in the spiritual, and they were so, so touched by that, they were so admired by that, that they said, you know what? You guys sacrifice a lot. We're going to meet your material needs. What you need, whatever you need, we're going to give to you. And that's the respect of a man of God. Amen. They met the need. Praise God. And the Bible says in verse 11, after three months were departed, they departed into a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. And, leading, and landing at Syracuse, we tarried there for three days. And from thence we fetched a compass and came to Regium. Now this, this place, I looked this up today, this place is still in existence in Italy. Still in existence. Very modern, but still in existence. And after one day, the south wind blew, and we came next, to, next day to uh, Potoli where we found brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days and so went toward Rome. So now he's getting ready, he's getting ready toward the end of, of his trip. He's getting ready to get to Rome and to be tried by Caesar. And then, of course, you know um, that the Apostle Paul, the legend of him was that he was beheaded. Uh, it's not in Scripture that he was beheaded, but it's it's also in a lot of the extra biblical writings of Josephus, um, Eusebius, uh, historians that lived uh, within that time frame. And um, they all have writings of him being executed.
by beheading and Peter being crucified upside down. So that's where we get that information from. Um, so the, the date of the fire is probably in somewhere in 64 to 67 before the last year of Nero's reign uh, when uh, Rome was, that great fire of Rome, you might know the history where Rome was set on fire and, and they blamed all the Christians. So there was great persecution at that time. So he says, um, and from thence when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Appi Forum. And the three taverns whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and he took courage. Amen. Probably hadn't slept in a good place for a long time. So you know, a lot of the teaching today is God wants you rich. And that's not necessarily true. God will bless you, and as long as you're a blessing to others, he'll continue to bless you. But the moment you become covetous and say, this is mine, it's all mine, it's, you know, then you won't be blessed. You know, because he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. But if you give, it shall be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give into your bosom. So God loves a cheerful giver because God will always repay back. And so here, you know, he comes and he sees these things. His needs were met now. You know, he was wet and he was cold. And now he's getting back, you know, uh, to uh, normal, if I can say that. And now his needs are being met. And he sees this tavern and he thanks God for these places to go and, and rest. And he took courage. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. That's God's favor. So even in a situation like that, even in a situation where he was being uh, brought into a prison, he wasn't treated like the other prisoners. All the other prisoners were thrown into a cell together. He was by himself with a soldier that kept him. Now, you'll see a scripture come to life a little bit. This soldier that was with him was chained to him. And so the soldier, they did in shifts, of course, like every other position in prisons or whatever. And you can imagine that um, him being in this prison and this God being chained to him and the, and, the, and the God is standing there like this. For how many hours? I don't know. Could have been three hours. Could have been six hours. Could have been eight hours. We don't know. But just think, we'll, we'll take the less of all of them. We'll say three hours. He's standing here like this, chained to Paul. Isn't it any wonder that Paul used the analogy in Timothy, endure hardship as a good soldier? how he used that analogy of hardship as a good soldier. And so the soldier was with him and stood by him and kept him. And verse 17 says, And it came to pass that after three days Paul called the chief of the Jews together, and when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, Though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. He's pleading his case once again, and he's telling them, I have done nothing wrong. I am innocent of all these charges that are being brought against me. And he says, Who, when they had examined me, would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. In other words, the charges are bogus. They mount to nothing. But how many know that conspiracy can make it look like a certain thing, sound like a certain thing? And they can set you up with false witnesses 
And that may happen to you someday as a Christian. You may get a false accusation against you. you may, people may say bad things about you. But you know what? It doesn't matter what they say. It matters what you do. It just matters that you continue in the faith and not give up. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. For the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. Now, you remember when Jesus was being crucified and the Jews and the Pharisees and all the leaders of their time were saying, when Pilate said, what should we do with this man? And they said, crucify him. And they said, yeah, but it's a, it's a custom of your time to let go one Barabbas or Jesus. Who do you want us to let go? And they, he said, Barabbas. But I find no fault in Jesus. If you let him go, you're no friend of Caesar, for he says he was a king. So they started all these accusations and all these falsehoods against Jesus. And then finally he was commanded to be crucified. And then, um, then Pilate said to them, well, I wash my hands of this because his blood is not on my hands. And they all cried out, let his blood be upon us and on our children. That was a self-pronounced curse. And look what's happened to the Jewish people, how they have suffered. And a lot of times people will say, well, they suffered because they were Jews. And I say, no, I don't think so. I think they suffered because of the curse that was placed upon them. And can they be free from that curse? Absolutely, by accepting the Messiah, Jesus. That can be broken. Because that for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, we neither receive letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. Well, see, now what's happening now is now that they're going to be before the Roman courts, they don't want to tell lies. Okay? They don't want to be caught. Now they're back what they call what we call backpedaling. Okay? But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest for us concerning this sect. We know that everywhere it is spoken against. Some call them Christians. Some call them the way. Some call, you know, call them uh, false believers, heresy. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many unto him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God. So many today from pulpits in America are promoting the kingdom of their ministry. I, I was watching a documentary of, of sorts of, I think it's 20 of the richest preachers in the world. Anyone have an, any idea who the richest preacher in the world is? The number one? Nope, he's close. They're, they're both close, but not quite. John Hagee, no. Kenneth Copeland. His net worth is $740 million. It's amazing. Big business. And so... Um, When he bought one of his jets for, I think it was $10 million, he said he needed it for the ministry. And then uh, somebody was interviewing him, a reporter, and said, well, how come you have a second jet? And you know what he told him? It's none of your business. But people continue to give thousands, if not thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars into the ministry, millions. Okay. And he's, he's, the, the false teaching that's there is unbelievable. 
but yet in the eyes of Christendom, he's a great success. But Paul was testifying of the kingdom of God. He wants grandma to shake him. Gee. Yeah. And see? I just quiet. Boom. He was preaching and testifying and expounding the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus. Both out of the law, well, I'm sorry for those of you who don't believe we need the Old Testament anymore. The law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. Talk about a long Bible study. And the Bible says, and some believed the things which were spoken and some believed not. You're always going to have that dichotomy. You're going to have those that will believe and those who won't believe. And there are sometimes there are the ones that won't believe will never believe. That's just the way it is because they choose not to. I believe that any time the kingdom of God is preached, just like I believe all the times that we've preached in this church, all the times we've talked about judgment, every time we've talked about standing before God and giving account, not one person that has heard my voice can escape the responsibility when they stand before God. Can't say they never heard. And it's funny because people can laugh, they can joke, they can ridicule, they can live one way in the church, one way at home, and think they're going to get away with it. They're not. They might try to fool me as a pastor or other pastors. You can't fool me. You can fool us, but you can't fool God. God knows. And just that hypocrisy is very, very dangerous. Because when you are living a, a hypocritical life, you will make mistakes and you will do things to cover up your image. And some believe the things which were spoken, some believe not. It's a choice. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers. He's using the Old Testament. He's using the Old Testament to bring a scriptural truth into their Christian lives or into their lives, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross. Now, one thing about wax, it has to be soft before it is hard. It gradually becomes hard. You can have a, you can have a soft heart and through life's situations and circumstances, your heart can become very, very, very hard. So hard that you don't even realize it. You don't even realize it. And then one day God shows you, and it just breaks it open. And you begin to weep before God and say, God, I don't know why my heart was so hard in this area, and I didn't even see it. You know that sin is deceptive. Sin is deceptive. It will deceive you in thinking that you can still continue in it and get away with it. But the Bible says when sin is conceived, it brings forth what? Death. And people don't understand. Well, that's why did that person backslide? Why is that person cold before God? Why is that person not coming anymore to church? Why isn't that person not reading their Bible? Why is it? Well, because it started somewhere. It just didn't happen when they don't come anymore, when, they, when they're not concerned about the things of God anymore. It happens gradually. So my question is, is that why didn't they see it happening when it was gradual? 
because they think that they can still do it and get away with it. And it's not going to happen. It's not, it'll happen for a little while, but it won't happen for a long time. And eventually what happens is the bad will take over the good. We go from worse. It's like the pig returning to its own vomit. It goes right back to the same things, and it's worse than it was in the beginning. For the heart of this people is waxed gross. Has God been speaking something to you? Has God put his finger on an area of your life that you need to finally, once and for all, turn over to him? If he's been doing that, don't ignore it because what will happen is your heart will wax harder and harder and harder until you get to the point where you just don't care anymore. And then what happens is you start to blame others and start to find the reason for justification for what you do by blaming others. Well, it's this person's fault because they make me this and they make me that and they make me angry, so I got to take a drink or I got to smoke a, a, a weed I, or I got to smoke a cigarette or I got to do this. So you start to blame other people. Or you just don't care anymore. And eventually, God is going to catch up with you. Amen? Eventually, he's going to catch up with you. And me. And he says, um, they wax gross and their ears are dull of hearing. What does that mean? You're going deaf? <laughs> yeah, spiritually. You begin to stop hearing the spiritual. And, you be, and you, all you can hear is the worldly things, the natural things. And your tendency is to hear things that are natural. And what happens is the more you start to hear things that are natural, guess what? Your faith begins to dwindle. Because faith comes by, uh-oh, Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans said. Faith comes by hearing. If you're not hearing, they that are they that are the children of they that are led by the Spirit, they are the children of God. Not all not every person is a, is a child of God. I'm sorry. You might hear it on TV, you might hear these preachers say, every one of us is a child of God. No, we're not. No. God is the one who created us. Just like if a person has a baby, if a woman has a baby with a man and he takes off, he's not a father. But a child is one who is brought in to the family. John says this, to as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. So if we're all sons of God, how come the Bible says there's sons, there are those that are of God and those that are of the devil? How can they be the children of God and be a children, child of the devil? Read the scripture. We're not all children. We're, through, we're children through adoption by receiving Christ. Into the, then we're adopted into the family. We have the spirit of adoption. What's that? You can see a child on TV and say, that's my ch child. I'm the father. No, you're not until you adopt him. Once you adopt him, then you're the father or you're the mother. Something has to take place. And their ears were dull of hearing. What happens is you begin to listen less and less and less to the voice of God and more and more to the voice of people that are around you, your family, um, the world, your workplace. You begin to listen to those things more so than listening to to the Bible, listen to what God's Word says, listen to what the Spirit of God says. And so what happens is that causes a dull of hearing, which causes a dullness in your walk, which creates worldliness. And you begin, sometimes people get mad at me because I'll say something and it'll be conviction to them. And they're saying, why are you judging me? And I'm like, I'm not judging you. I just said a statement. 
I'm saying a statement. If something happens in this conviction, check the Holy Spirit. He speaks through us. Amen. He speaks through us. And you have to realize that, that sometimes it's, uh, even if it's somebody you call on the phone and they say something, or somebody you know, it can be a sinner. And they say something, and it's like, oh. And God is using that person to speak to you. Please don't tell God how to speak to you. Okay? Don't tell God, I'll, I'll only listen to you if you speak this way to me. No, he's going he's gonna to choose how he, sp he speaks to you. He might tell you, go down to the beach and sit on the bench. I'll talk to you there. Well, God, you're talking to me now. Why don't you just talk to me now? Because he's looking for obedience. When you're obedient to what he says, he'll speak further. If you're going to be disobedient, he's not going to give you anything else. Come on. He did that to Jeremiah when he told him, go down to the potter's house. Why do I go down to the potter's house? You're talking to me right now, God. Why don't you just tell me what you, what's on your mind? No, he didn't say that. What did he do? He went down to the potter's house. God told me, if you go down to the potter's house, I'll speak to you there. See, we can't tell God when and how and who to use to speak to us. Amen? So they were dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed. First comes the dullness of hearing, then the, dull, the dullness or the, or the blindness spiritually, that you will not even be, know where you're going or what you're doing or where you truly are with God. You know, there's some people that think they're way up here with God, but they're actually way back here. But they think they're here, but they're way back here. How do you know that? By their fruit. See, the only thing I can, t I, the only thing I can tell you, and I can give you an example, is me. Because I didn't know all of you before. I can only tell you about me. Okay? When I got saved, when I first got saved, Back in 1978, when I first got saved, there were services five to six times a week. And I wanted to be in every single one of those services. I couldn't wait to go to church. I couldn't wait to be in those services. I couldn't wait to praise the Lord. I couldn't wait. And I'm talking three, four-hour services. I'm not talking two hours, hour and 45 minutes, let's go home. I'm talking about four, five-hour services. I could not get enough of God. I wanted all of it. And that continued all the way through to my, to my adult Christian life also. My former pastor, Wednesday night, we'd start at 7, we'd get out at 11. Right, hon? By the time we, we, we were done asking questions and talking, it was almost like 10.30, quarter of 11, we were heading out the door, and we were still talking as we were going out the door. A three-hour Bible study. And people were hungry. We wanted to be there. We couldn't wait. I used to come up when I lived in New Bedford before I got married. I used to go up in an eight-inch snowstorm with Sister Debbie. And we leave New Bedford, and we drive all the way up there for a Bible study. And there was only four people there. Why? Because I was hungry. I wanted the word. Where's that hunger today? You don't see it. What you see is the flashy lights, the black ceilings, the black altar, no cross, no pulpit, no real expository preaching. You see entertainment with the lights and the smoke and all of that stuff, and people flock to that. I was talking to somebody about the, the church. New Life just bought a building down the south end here somewhere, a factory. They're up to 800 people. And you sit there and you go, okay. But it's not my business how they got those people. But I can guarantee you they're not all saved. They didn't get them all saved. They came from other churches they pulled out. But I feel sorry for them because how they stand in the day of persecution when the lights are no longer there, when the flashiness is not there, the entertainment isn't there, okay? You can worship God in the flesh, you know. 
The Bible says they that worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. In spirit. Now your flesh is involved because you're raising your hands. But there are people that raise their hands and they go home and can commit adultery. They go home and smoke pot. They go home and out to the nightclubs on Saturday night. They do all those other things. But they come to church and they worship God. Your eyes will be dull. You won't see correctly. You won't discern correctly. Dull of hearing and their eyes have they closed unless they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted. And I should heal them. It's not about believing. It's not about confessing. Only. It's about being converted. Conversion means that you were this and you were converted and now you're this. No longer that. You follow what I'm saying? But even as you're this, you've been converted, if you don't Feed your spirit, man. You're going to be feeding your natural man. And your natural man will take over, and you begin to think like the natural. You begin to see in the natural. Your ears will become dull to the things of God. And you'll be more drawn to the natural things. And, and I see people. I've seen people do this. They go right back to the same thing that they were doing before. They put themselves in the same position as they were before, thinking, well, I'm strong enough to be in this position now. Oh, really? I thought it had to do with God's keeping power, not you. See how the focus changes? It goes from God keeping power to, oh, I can, I can handle this now. That's pride. A haughty spirit goes before, pride goes before a haughty spirit, a haughty spirit before a fall. So they put themselves right back in the same situation, right? where before they were coming to church on a regular basis, coming to prayer on a regular basis, coming to Bible study on a regular basis, and now guess what? They barely show up at sometimes when they feel like it. What, has, what have you just done? You've put yourself in the same position you were before. And then when you were there before, you were crying out, God help me, things aren't right, uh, things are not going right, things are falling apart. Well, guess what? Why did you come back here? You belong over here. And God in his love and his mercy and his grace, he pats you on the butt, gives you a little spank and says, come on, son, wake up. Come on, daughter, wake up. Now get over here where you belong. This is where you belong. Not over there. You belong over here. Lest they be converted. And I should heal them. We don't need more confessors. We, need, we don't need more decisions. You know, I, I didn't like that when Billy Graham had that. Well, we had a thousand decisions. Well, that's fine. You got to, I make decisions and I change my decisions every day. Oh, I think I'll go to a store. Nah, maybe I won't. I'll go tomorrow. Making a decision for Christ isn't where it's at. It's being converted. It's making a choice to lay down your life. I'm sick of these mamby-pamby prayers of salvation where there's no repentance. How can you be saved? How can you be converted? How can you be transformed unless there's, con unless there's conviction and there's repentance? It's impossible. Jesus said, repent or perish. But there's got to be repentance. But everybody wants to be a Christian now because it's popular. You know, you get God's favor, man, he'll give you cars and he'll give you health and wealth and he'll give you all this stuff. Well, who wouldn't want to be... Part of that, let's join the club. How much does it cost to join? What's the annual uh, cost of the, of the membership? That's not what it's about. True biblical conversion, true biblical Christianity is a, is a person who has been converted from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, the kingdom of unrighteousness to the kingdom of righteousness. 
There has been a change in the person. There has been a change in the person. And it hasn't come through behavioral choices. It didn't come because I decided I needed to change and I changed myself. That person is not converted. That person just turned over a new leaf. Because there are thousands and thousands of good people in the world that are moral, that don't commit adultery, that don't steal, don't do any of those things. And, you know, and there's some that have been drug addicts and other things, and they've turned their life around without even God in their life. It's happened. So turning over a new leaf is not conversion. Conversion is admitting who you are, admitting what you need, and changing by repenting and taking, being taken out of the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light. It's a conversion experience. It's a transformation that takes place. As we said many times before, it's a metamorphosis, a change. It's an inward change. It changes from the inward where you're not dependent on yourself or your strengths of your personality, but where you are trusting God to do what he said he would do. And he changes you from the inside out. That's why a person who's only changed from the outside will go back to the way they live. But it doesn't last. Something, something will happen in their life where it will be traumatic or it will be really awful that will happen. And you see them go back all the time. I see it all the time, Christians. They go running back into the world or they go running back, oh, I was hurt, uh, I was hurt by the pastor. So you were hurt by the pastor. So what? So you're using that as a justification for going back into the world? When Jimmy Swaggett fell, hundreds and hundreds of people fell backslid. Well, maybe they had their eyes on Jimmy Swaggett rather than on God. I didn't backslide. I liked Jimmy Swaggett. I used to watch him all the time. But when he fell, I didn't fall. Because my God is not Jimmy Swaggett. My God is Jesus Christ. And when PTL fell apart, I didn't fall apart. Why? Because my hope was not built on them. Be it known, therefore, unto you that salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they will hear it. I should have got, at least got a good shout of amen right here. Because you know what? You're all Gentiles. We're all Gentiles here tonight. Oh, I know some, some maybe want to put on the spiritual Jewness. You know, because we've been adopted into the family of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You know, so therefore we're adopted, so we're Jews. No, you're not a Jew. You're a Gentile, saved by grace through, his, through faith. So don't go home and put on the little yarmulke and the little shawl and go running around trying to learn Hebrew words. Not necessary. The Gentiles, they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him. His ministry still kept on going. He didn't say, well, you know, I'm in prison, I'm going to go before Caesar. It's already been prophesied to me that I'm going to die, so why bother? No, he followed the words of Jesus. Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. That didn't mean occupy with the things of this world, but occupy with the things of his kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That means seek to advance that kingdom in your life first. And his righteousness. And then all these other things will be added to you that you need. Amen? And so they received all that came in unto him, preaching, this is what he preached, the kingdom of God 
and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. In other words, he had free access, free reign, even being detained. He didn't look to himself. He didn't look uh, at pity for himself where he was not able to be a free person, but yet he still put others first. That's such a great testimony of a Christian life is putting others first no matter what. And so now we conclude the study on the book of Acts. Now in April, I mean April, August 9th, we'll be handing out the certificates to you. If you've been here 80% of the time, you'll get one. If you haven't been here, then you need to go back online and on the website. If you promise to read them, I'll take your word for it and go through the studies. Um, some have missed quite a bit, so it'll take you a little bit longer to do that. Listen to it in your car as you drive and whatever. And as soon as you complete it, let me know, and we'll, we'll give you a certificate in the Book of Acts of Religious Life. Are there any questions as we close tonight's service? Any comments? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hebrew Joshua. Anyone else? Yes, Jim. Yes, he did. <laughs> yeah, he did answer you, though. Amen.